Hi, my name is Vincent Jacquemont. I'm working for the National Center for Scientific Research in France, and my lab is at University Claude Bernard in Lyon. I am going to present you a summary of this paper that we recently published in the Journal of General Physiology. I would like to specifically acknowledge the funding contribution made by the French Muscular Dystrophy Association, the AFM Teleton, to this project. This is a story about excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscle. This is the process through which electrical activity generated by the nerve command in the membrane of the muscle fibers triggers contraction. It all starts with action potentials generated at the end plates propagating throughout the surface membrane and within the transverse invagination of this membrane, which we call the transverse tubules, the T-tubules. There, the depolarization triggers the release of calcium from an intracellular store, which is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, DSR. The consequent increase in cytosolic calcium concentration is what triggers the activation of the contractile machinery. If we look more closely into this region, here we have the transverse tubule membrane, here the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane, and we have two sets of proteins facing each other. In the T-tubule membrane, these are the dihydropyridine receptors, the DHPR. They are voltage-gated calcium channels, and they are facing and likely directly communicating with another type of calcium channel, which is a calcium release channel. This is riodine receptor, type 1, essentially, in mammalian muscle. And the way we think things work is that when the depolarization, the action potential, reaches this region, it changes the conformation of the DHPRs, and this is what in turn triggers the opening of the randy receptor calcium release channel. Now, this is a simplified picture of this process, which is obviously much more complicated. And for instance, there is a number of accessory proteins present in this environment that are either known or presumed to regulate the process. Similarly, there is a number of messenger molecules that are also suspected to play a role in the regulation of EC coupling. Among these molecules, we've been interested recently in the possible role of phosphoenositides. In the present work, we've been specifically interested in this phosphoenositide, which is phosphatidylinase.45-bisphosphate, which I will call PIP2 for simplicity. PIP2 is by far the most popular and most well-studied phosphoenositide First, because it is a precursor of the well-known calcium mobilizing agent IP3. But PIP2 has also gained in popularity because it has been shown to directly regulate the activity of a number of proteins, including ion channels, including calcium channels, including voltage-gated calcium channels. And there is also indication that even the activity of the calcium release channel in skeletal muscles around the receptor could be modulated by the level of PIP2. So this made it a sufficient number of reasons to explore the physiological role of P2 in the regulation of EC coupling. We were also motivated in this project by the discovery 10 years ago of the protein that is portrayed here. This is a voltage-sensitive phosphoenositide phosphatase. It is a protein which has a membrane-spanning region with a voltage-sensitive domain very similar to what is found in voltage-gated ion channels but there is no ion channel. There is a phosphoenositide phosphatase that is capable of dephosphorylating PIP2. And dephosphorylation of PIP2 is triggered by membrane depolarization as very simply pictured here. So this makes it a magnificent molecular tool to trigger a decrease in the level of PIP2 in the plasma membrane of a living cell simply by depolarizing this membrane. And this makes it also very easy to stop the decrease in PIP2 by repolarizing the membrane. So we thought expressing the PSP in muscle fibers would be an interesting way to study the role of PIP2 in excitation contraction coupling. For this, we transfected small muscles from mouse with plasmid constructs encoding a VSP and EGFP as expression reporter. After a week or so, we isolate the muscle fibers from the transfected muscles, and we look for the green ones. In a few experiments, we used plasmid construct encoding a fused version of VSP and EGFP. 
This is a confocal image from a muscle fiber expressing this construct. It produced a very nice transverse striated pattern, giving this type of profile double peaks separated by 2 micrometers. This is very consistent with the VSP being localized within the transverse tubular membrane of the muscle fibers. We need then to control the membrane voltage of the muscle fiber and to measure SR calcium release. For this, we're using the silicone voltage clamp technique. It consists in having a single muscle fiber sitting on a layer of silicone grease. The fiber is then painted with more silicone so that only a short end portion of the fiber is out of it. We then have a micropipette filled with an intracellular medium containing the calcium sensitive dye ROAD2 together with EGTA to prevent contraction. The tip of the micropipette is inserted in the fiber through the silicone and we wait for the dye to diffuse. When the dye has equilibrated, we take fluorescence measurement using a confocal microscope in line scan mode and we measure calcium transients triggered by voltage clamp depolarization. In most of our experiments, we express the VSP called CIVSP, initially isolated from the tunicate cyanintestinalis. This is the voltage dependence of activation of CIVSP as reported in the literature. This is the voltage dependence of activation of SR calcium release in mouse muscle fibers. It shows that it should be possible to measure SR calcium release fully activated, either in a range of voltages where the VSP will be very little activated, or in a range of voltage where the VSP will be very substantially activated. Comparing calcium release between these two situations should tell us whether activating the VSP and depleting PIP2 in the tubule membrane affects SR calcium release. Here is our first trial. The muscle fiber is depolarized for 5 seconds from minus 80 to plus 20 millivolts and then for 5 seconds from minus 80 to plus 120 millivolts to activate the VSP. These are ROAD2 fluorescence transients recorded in the VSP negative fibers in response to these two pulses. They look the same. There is a fast initial rise followed by a more or less complex phase with a slow decay spontaneous during the pulse. These are transients recorded in the CIVSP expressing fiber. The initial peak doesn't seem to be much affected by the pulse to plus 120 millivolt, but the slow decay appears to be faster during this pulse as compared to the pulse to plus 20 millivolt. This effect was quantitatively small in average, but significant. And we took this as a first evidence, first indication that activating the VSP may have a depressing effect on calcium release. Now, this is a situation which is a bit complicated because we suspect that during such a long pulse, it would take time for the VSP to substantially deplete PIP2. At the same time, we know that during such a pulse, calcium release goes through a very fast initial peak and then decay very rapidly during the pulse. So probably not the best situation to test the effect of PIP2 depletion on calcium release. In order to circumvent the problem, we use trains of shorter depolarizing pulses, allowing to keep calcium release being activated during long periods of time. We first applied what we call the control protocol, consisting of 20 200 milliseconds long pulses from minus 80 to plus 10 millivolts. And then we applied a test protocol consisting of 10 pulses, again from minus 80 to plus 10 millivolts, and then 10 pulses to plus 100 millivolts to activate the VSP. This is a response of a VSP negative fiber to the control protocol and then to the test protocol. The two responses are not exactly the same, but they follow a very similar trend in terms of peak amplitude of the calcium transient. Now, this is a response of a VSP positive fiber to the control protocol and then to the test protocol. And what we could observe in a very reproducible manner is that the 10 pulses to plus 100 millivolts were accompanied by a substantial decrease of the peak calcium transient. This graph presents mean values for the ratio of the relative peak amplitude of the calcium transients during the test protocol to the corresponding relative peak amplitude 
during the control protocol. In the VSP negative fibers, this ratio remained close to 1. In the CIVSP expressing fibers, the ratio dropped as the large parcels were applied. In average, the PKR sum transient was depressed by about 30% following the large parcels to plus 100 millivolts. An interesting feature of this effect is that it was transient, meaning we could apply a control protocol and then a test, and then the control again, and then a test again, and we would see the effect during the first test protocol, but then it's, it's back to normal, and then we would see the effect again during the second test protocol. This is very consistent with the possibility that the large process to plus 100 millivolts induce the transient loss of a molecule that promotes calcium release. Now, could it be that uh, this molecule is PIMP2? In order to check for this, we co-transfected muscle fibers with the plasmid encoding VSP and with a plasmid encoding a protein domain that binds specifically to PIMP2. This domain was the plextrin homology domain of phospholipase C delta 1 and it was fused with MRFP. The plasmid was a generous gift from Tamash Bala from the NIH. Here are confocal images of a muscle fiber that was co-transfected. Here are the image of the EGFE from the VSP plasmid, here are the MRFP fluorescence, and, and, and the MRFP fluorescence yielded a transverse striated pattern which again followed this double peak separated by 2 micrometers, so very consistent with the possibility that we are looking at here, the probe being bound to PIP2 in the transverse tubule membrane of the muscle fiber. Now, let's see what the uh, uh, PIP2 binding probe tells us. You are going to see successive confocal images of the MRFP fluorescence in the voltage clamp muscle fiber that will be depolarized from minus 80 millivolts to the values that will be shown here in the top left corner of the images. You're going to see there is substantial photo bleaching, but this is not what we're interested in. Plus 10 millivolt, not much is happening. Plus 50 millivolt, the pattern disappears. Plus 90 millivolts again. So there is a reversible disappearance of the pattern when applying the large depolarizing pulses. And we believe this makes it quite convincing that what we are looking at here is the translocation of the probe from the T-tubule to the cytosol in response to activation of the VSP and consistent, of course, with the large pulses depleting PIP2 from the T-tubule membrane. Conclusions. Well, combination of voltage clamp with VSP expression makes it a quite nice tool to study the consequences of changes in PIP2 in the plasma membrane of muscle fibers. Activation of VSP depletes PIP2 in the T-tubule membrane. What is equally interesting is that recovery of PIP2 is very fast. It occurs within seconds. And main point, activation of VSP, and we believe consequent loss of PIP2 depresses voltage activated SR calcium release. Questions? Well, could there be physiological conditions and or pathological conditions that may lead to PIP2 depletion so as to affect SR calcium release? And then what is a PIP2 target mechanism? Well, we cannot exclude that PIP2 would act as precursor of IP3, but we also suspect that PIP2 may interact with a protein partner of the EC coupling machinery. In this respect, I would strongly recommend reading a very insightful comment that was recently published by Bernard Fluker in JGP. Thank you. Thank you so much for your interest.